awake before, you were awake now. And that's a great way to introduce um, Alexis Billings, who focuses on the alarm calls of um, a variety of chick the three species of chickadees and the stellar jay, um, looking at the ecology and evolution of the avian systems. Um, Alexis is coming to us from Missoula. She's in Eric Green's lab. She's finishing up her PhD uh, in Organismal Biology and Ecology and Evolution in the Division of Biological Sciences. And uh, I will, without further ado, give you any more introduction, I'll let her take over from here. So, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, first Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so I studied bird calls, as you heard from that, specifically the really harsh, obnoxious calls that, uh, called alarm calls, that are given in response to predators or to danger. Um, so my dissertation is focused on the ecology and evolution of avian alarm call signaling systems, and today I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of what I've been working on for the last five years. Um, before I get started, though, I, of course, did not do any of this research alone, so I have numerous people to quickly acknowledge and thank before we get into the science. Um, my advisor, she says, Eric Green, who's been really wonderful supportive. I have a great committee. Um, I've had lots of help from friends and undergrads and even masters and other PhD students. Um, in the field as well as with analysis. I do a lot of my field work at bird feeders, so there's a lot of people who let me sit in their bushes like a weirdo, which I really appreciate. Um, I have collaborators at the Lev Ornithology at Cornell as well as Australian National University, and then of course, can't do science without money, so all my funding sources. Okay, so back to the ecology and evolution of avian alarm pulse signaling systems. So in 1948, Claude Shannon, is a he's a mathematician and an electrical engineer, and he came up with information theory. And information theory essentially is a way to quantify the transfer of information. And it can be applied to any transfer of information. And when we apply it to a natural signaling system, it sets up communication as this really simple process where a sender receives in some sort of information from the environment, encodes and transmits that information in a signal, which then travels through the environmental space where it's corrupted and degraded, and then finally hitting a receiver where it's decoded and used. However, this uh, actually may be a little overly simplistic because in reality, there are actually multiple types and sources of information that hit multiple senders, who in turn send multiple signals through multiple environments, finally hitting multiple receivers. This is a really complex figure, but this is actually how communication systems exist. And even though this is a much simpler way to look at it, it's possibly too simplistic and we may be missing stuff if we don't look at it with all of these pieces. And so this is what my dissertation is focused on, um, looking at both individually and in tandem each part of this communication scheme. Um, so a communication system is much more than the sum of its parts and it's therefore imperative to look at each aspect of this um, in order to understand the signaling system as a whole. So, we're going to see this little schematic a lot throughout the rest of the talk, um, but real quickly I want to give you some backgrounds into alarm calls so we're all on the same page. So when we talk about avian alarm calls, we have to talk about Peter Marler. In 1955, he wrote a paper uh, that was classified uh, avian calls by their context, purpose, and acoustic structure. Um, he did this in chaffinches, but it's since been applied to a lot of other species. So when it comes to alarm calls, they actually come in two flavors depending on the predator behavior. So we have the seat calls, and these are given to actively flying, or actively hunting or flying predators. Um, they tend to be really high frequency tones, um, in this example from a black cat chickadee. So this is a spectrogram. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but we're going to see a lot of them, so I'm going to orient you real quick and then we'll continue. So a spectrogram is essentially a visual representation of sound. It has frequency on the y-axis with low frequencies on the bottom, high frequencies on the top, and then time on the x-axis. And then the darkness corresponds to the amplitude or the intensity at that given frequency and time point. So in this example, we have six high frequency, about eight kilohertz tones given from a uh, black cat chickadee that sound like this. So when a seed call is given, uh, the other species that hear it actually freeze and either die for cover or actually start giving seed calls as well. Either way, they stop moving. Um, and it's thought that these, this acoustic structure is actually linked their, to their purpose and their context. So these are given to actively hunting predators. The last thing you'd want to do if, act, if a predator is actively hunting is give a call that's really easy to localize and travels really far. And so this acoustic structure, these short tones, are thought to be really difficult to localize and do not travel very far. So it seems that the context is linked to their purpose and structure. 
So in contrast, mobbing calls are given to perched predators or not actively hunting predators. Um, they look vastly different from seat calls. They tend to be really broadband, meaning they just cover a broad range of frequencies, as in this example from a black cat chickadee, and they sound really different from uh, seat calls. So when uh, mobbing calls are given, something really different happens. So instead of fleeing or diving for cover, they actually come to the caller and help the caller mob the predator from the area. So it's essential that mobbing calls are easy to localize as well as can travel really far in order to reach other individuals. And so it's thought that this broadband structure <coughs> means that these calls are easy to localize and can travel really far distances. So again, it seems that the context, purpose, and acoustic structure are all linked together. But we can take mobbing calls one step further. Um, in 2005, my advisor and his then uh, master's student, Chris Templeton, looked at mobbing calls closer, and they wanted to know how black cat chickadees alter their alarm calls when you vary the predator size. So do they give the same mobbing call regardless of to a large predator or to a small predator? And what they found is that chickadees actually do alter their mobbing calls, so there's another layer of complexity here. Um, to large predators, such as great gray owls or great horned owls, they give just a couple Ds, and Ds are those long stacks at the end of their call. And then to small predators, such as a sawwet owl or a pygmy owl, they tack on a lot of Ds. And so from this, we have now predator size influencing the structure of a certain call type. And so from this study came the allometric risk hypothesis, and the allometric risk hypothesis essentially predicts that avian predators and their avian prey are going to be size scaled. And this is really just because of maneuverability and turn radii. Big birds have a much larger turn radii and are less maneuverable than small birds, so they can't quite keep up. Okay, so from Peter Marler, we have predator behavior dictating a call type, mob and receipt. And then from Templeton et al., we have within a call type, predator body size dictating modic call acoustic structure. So this is actually a pretty complicated figure, but it's way more complex than this. And again, this is where my dissertation comes in, is starting to try to piece apart all these other aspects of a signaling system. Um, so it's really hard to actually tease these things apart without experiments, so my dissertation is focused on experimentally probing each piece of this communication scheme. So as I mentioned, we're going to be following this scheme throughout the rest of the talk. So I divided my questions in my questions of my dissertation into three main categories, the sender, environmental space, and the receiver portion. So I'm going to spend the majority of the time talking about two projects focusing on the sender portion, uh, specifically how do senders use multivariate information to assess and communicate about danger. I'm going to give a really quick uh, overview of a, a little side project that I did looking at environmental space and how mobbing calls are acoustically structured for successful transmission through different habitats. And then finally, I want to present some preliminary data that I did um, on a project that I did in Australia a couple years ago, um, looking at how the identity of the sender influences receiver response. Okay, so the first question is focusing on senders. How do senders use multivariate information to assess and communicate about danger? So as I mentioned, I actually have two projects that get at this question. I have one in the three species of chickadees and one in stellar jays. Both of these projects were completed at bird feeders in the winter months. Um, this is for a couple reasons. One, it's when the birds are flocked. Two, it means that they're visiting feeders consistently. Um, three, it means we can sample the same flock over and over again. And four, there's nothing better than sitting outside when it's 15 degrees. So uh, the feeders are located around Missoula as well as in the Metow Valley in the eastern Cascades of Washington, and the yellow diamonds indicate a feeder location. So I'm going to focus on the chickadee project first because it's the one that we did first. Um, so specifically, we were interested in how chickadees respond to an acoustic predator cue. So if you remember from Templeton and my advisor, Eric, looked at the number of Ds that chickadees give when they see a predator. So they perched out live predators from Kate Davis, actually if you're familiar with records of the Rockies, um, and then recorded their calls. So we were interested in uh, what happens to their mobbing calls when they hear predators of different sizes instead of seeing predators of different sizes. Can they even distinguish between the calls? And if they do, how do they communicate this information? And we also wanted to look at three species of chickadees instead of just one. So we focused on the black cat, the mountain, and the chestnut-backed chickadee. 
Um, so again, I didn't do this work alone, and I have two undergrads who were really helpful in this. They actually did part of this project for their senior honors theses. So Maggie Reboyne and Sophia Jensen. Okay, so following the elementary risk hypothesis, again, where predators and their prey are going to be size scaled, we can actually come up with predictions based on size um, of what we expect to be the most threatening to chickadees. So um, we used a Townsend solitaire, which is a non-predatory songbird, as a control. We played the calls of a northern goshawk, uh, which is much too big to take a chickadee. Um, so the little bracket there is actually the size of the chickadee in relation to the predator. Uh, a Sharpton hawk was deemed a moderate to high threat. It can probably take a chickadee, and it is a bird specialist. And then finally, northern pygmyal being the highest threat, it is actually a chickadee's worst nightmare, and the majority of northern pygmyal diet consists of chickadees in the winter. So the playback uh, protocol was actually pretty simple. Uh, we went to people's backyards, hit a speaker about 10 to 20 meters away, and then hid in the bushes, and waited for the birds to return to normal foraging activity. Once they did that, we recorded them for two minutes, and this gave us just a baseline measurement of their acoustic activity. Chickadees, if you are familiar with them, are never quiet, and they're constantly calling, so we wanted a baseline level, level of acoustic activity. Uh, we then presented a stimulus for two minutes, called the playback period, and then continued to record for five minutes, called the post-playback period. Then we looked at a whole slew of acoustic measurements. So like I said, we looked at three species of chickadees, the black cat, mountain, and chestnut back chickadee. I'm only going to focus on the black cat and the mountain chickadee, um, presenting those results, but if you want to talk about the chestnut back chickadee later, I'm happy to talk about it. So for black cat and mountain chickadees, um, you can tell the difference between the two species by their chickadee calls. We have the black cat, and then we have the mountain, a little more raspy. Um, so what we, one of the measurements that we took is we looked at the total number of chickadee calls that were given by both of these species indicated by the red bracket. We then broke down their chickadee call to look at how many chickas indicated by the green bracket they gave, as well as how many Ds that made up their chickadee call. And so the orange bracket, this is what Templeton et al. found to be significant when they see predators of different sizes. So chickadees can also give chickas um, without Ds that sound like this. Um, we cannot distinguish between black cat and mountain chickas alone, so they have to be grouped together. So what we did is we looked at the total number of chicka calls that were given, indicated by the blue bracket, and then the number of chicka elements indicated by the green bracket that made up the chicka call. And then finally, they give those high-frequency seat calls that I talked about earlier. We cannot distinguish between the three species by their seat call alone, so they had to be lumped together. Um, and so that, again, the high-frequency calls sound like this, kind of similar to chickas, but they look different. Um, and so we counted essentially indicated by the purple brackets, the number of high-frequency C calls that they gave. Okay, so coming back to our predictions, again, predicting that size is going to dictate threat level. This is what most of the graphs are going to look like. We have stimulus on the x-axis with in order of threat level, and then on the y-axis is the difference from baseline. So we took that baseline measurement and subtracted it from the playback and the post-playback, and this was just to try to control for some of that pre-variation. So a negative number means there was fewer calls than baseline, zero means no change, a positive number means more calls than baseline. Okay, so what did we find? For the total number of chicka calls, we found that for the most part they followed our predictions with them giving more chicka calls in response to the northern pygmyon both during the playback as well as after the playback was over. When we look at just chickas, it also follows the same pattern. Um, to Northern Pygmyal, they give more chicka calls with more chicka elements during the playback period and in the post-playback period, so after the call ends, that stimuli ends, they're still giving more chicka calls but not more elements in it. And then finally, the high frequency, and this is my favorite result, um, actually didn't follow our predictions, and this is where things got kind of exciting. They actually gave more high frequency C calls to sharp shin hawks, but only after the sharp shin hawk stopped calling. So this means we played a sharp shin hawk call, everything was fine and dandy, and then as soon as it stopped, they freaked out and they ramped up those high frequency C calls. So size alone cannot really explain this, so there has to be something else going on. And what we think is going on is that uh, sharp shin hawks and northern big males differ really significantly in their hunting strategies. So sharp shin hawks are aerial, um, are truly amazing in flight and uh, chase their prey down. 
whereas uh, northern pig nails just kind of fall out of trees onto chickadees. They're quite frumpy. So it could be that they're responding differently to these two predators of similar smaller size because of this hunting strategy. Okay, so that was a lot of chickadeeing. So what does this all actually mean? At least for black cat chickadees, it means that Q modality definitely matters. It matters if they see it or they hear the predators, and they encode that information really differently. And we suspect that their mountain chickadees would do the same. Um, it also means the size is important, but it's definitely not everything. So the alimentary risk hypothesis is not the only explanation for how they're uh, deciding what's threatening and what's not threatening. And that hunting strategy may actually be really important. So this brings us to the next project where we actually wanted to test if hunting strategy matters. So we did this in stellar shades, and the reason we switched to stellar shades is because chickadees are kind of the poster child for alarm calling. So we wanted to see if it's generalizable across the difference across species. So, how do stellar shades use multivariate information to assess and communicate about danger? So again, I didn't do this work alone. I actually had a high school student who did part of this work as his honors thesis for his senior year at Hellgate High School, Dylan McArthur Waltz. Okay, so stellar shades, if you're not familiar, though I'm sure most of you are familiar with this beautiful bird, um, are a medium-sized bird in the Corbett family that live in the coniferous forest of the West. Uh, we chose stellar jays for a um, number of reasons. First of all, they're hands down my favorite bird. Secondly, they are really interactive with each other and other species. Um, three, they have a really interesting vocal repertoire. Uh, four, there's not a lot known about the mommy calls of corvids in general because they're often seen as predators themselves in the breeding season. And then finally, they are gluttons for peanuts, which means they're really easy to attract to bird feeders, which is also really important. Okay. So as I mentioned, they have a really interesting vocal repertoire. They have two described alarm calls as well as predator mimicry. So we have the wah call, the weck call, and then predator mimicry. So I'm going to play you a red tail hawk call followed by the stellar shade mimic. It's not bad, right? Pretty decent. Better than us. Right? <laughs> So what we wanted to do when, I, when I'm talking about multivariate information, we actually wanted to experimentally alter the human hunting strategy and the size to see how they respond and encode this information um, in their alarm calls. So to alter hunting strategy and size, we actually just chose predators that differ in hunting strategy and size. So these are the stimuli that we chose. Um, the brackets indicate stellar shape size in comparison to the predator and the arrows indicate their hunting strategy. So we have two kind of pounce predators and two chase predators, two smaller size predators and two larger predators. So again, if that allometric risk hypothesis is correct, we would expect a linear relationship um, with threat level. So, um, <coughs> so it's the threat level alone indicating what uh, they deem threatening. Sorry, size alone. So we had a Townsend solitaire again as the control, non-predatory songbird. We put northern pig nail as the lowest of threat because it's much too small to take a stellar jay. Sharp chin hawk we also put as a moderate threat um, because it's about the same size of the stellar jay and the allometric risk hypothesis predicts that they're going to be size scaled, not size matched. Red tailed hawk was also considered a, was considered a high moderate threat. It's appropriately sized but it eats more mammals than it does birds. And then finally the northern goshawk being the highest threat, it's appropriately sized and is also a bird specialist. So again, the, uh, we also wanted to manipulate how they detected the predator, so whether they heard the predator or saw the predator. So for the acoustic cue, we essentially hit that speaker again about 10 to 20 meters away, waited for them to return to normal foraging, played one of the calls for two minutes, and then continued to record for five minutes afterwards. Um, for the visual cue, we actually created robotic raptors, which are what these are right here. So this is a goshawk and a northern pig meow. And so what essentially we did is we would put these out there with um, their heads on and their tails moving um, for four minutes. And then we had this tree trunk, this fake tree trunk, that we have a modified garage door opener that when we hide in the bushes, we can press it from afar and it will lower exposing the moving bird. Um, and then when we're finished, we can press it again and it will come back up. And then we can continue to record for five minutes after that. So that's that guy. Okay. Sorry, that's kind of distracting. Okay. So, 
Again, if the allometric risk hypothesis is correct, we expect these to be in a linear relationship. So all of the graphs are going to be looked like this. Stimulus is on the um, on the x-axis um, in uh, the order of which we predicted their threat level to be. And then on the y-axis, we don't have a baseline measurement, so it's just going to be number of calls of different acoustic variables. So for the acoustic project, we ended up with three field seasons, 21 feeders, and 224 playback experiments. For the visual, we had one field season, 10 feeders, and 40 experiments. So we also did something a little different than the chickadees, where instead of us assigning what should be threatening, we actually let them tell us what was threatening. So to do this, we measured the latency to resume foraging, or essentially how long it took them to come back to foraging if they stopped. Um, so I'm going to show you a little video of what this looks like. The stoichates are going to be feeding on peanuts. You'll hear a sharp and hot play, and you'll see them fly off and then come to the speaker and mop the speaker. essentially how long it took them to come back to foraging once they leave. We use this as a proxy for threat level. The longer they stay away, the more threatening the predator is. Okay, so what did we actually find for the latency to resume foraging? So we have acoustic on the top and visual on the bottom. Um, the y-axis is seconds to resume foraging and the stimulus is on the x-axis. We found that for the most part, it follows our predictions with cellulitates staying away longer to sharks and hawk, or sorry, to northern goshawks and to other predators, and then making a distinction between the visual and the acoustic. So they're staying away much longer to the visual cue to seeing the goshawk than to hearing the goshawk. But, and maybe not surprising after the percent of the chicken thing, the sharks and hawk again proves to be different. Um, so again, this shows that size is not everything, <coughs> because sharks and hawks and northern goshawks differ greatly in size. So they find sharks and hawks to be threat as threatening as northern goshawks, and they do not distinguish between hearing a sharp and hawk or seeing a sharp and hawk. Okay, so then to look at how they actually encode this information, we created spectrograms of all their of all the recordings and looked at a slew of acoustic measurements. So the first ones we looked at just the total number of wa, wek, and red tail hawk minute, minutes. Red tail hawk is the most common predator minute that they do, so that's how we measured that one. Um, we then broke down the WA and the WEC call, uh, indicated by the green bracket. So we looked at the number of elements that make up the WA and the WEC. So the WA has three elements, and the WEC call has 13 elements. And then we looked at the duty cycle of the WA and the WEC call. And the duty cycle is essentially the ratio of sound to silence. So in the example of the WA call, there's more sound than silence. So a duty cycle is greater than one. And the WEC call has about equal sound to silence, so a duty cycle of about one. Okay, so just to remind you what we found, sharp and hawks are threatening no matter if they hear or see it. Northern goshawks are threatening, but more threatening when they see it than when they hear it. Okay, so for total number of WA calls, we found that similar to their foraging behavior, they did not distinguish between the acoustic and the visual. So acoustic is in white, visual is in dark, and all the graphs are going to have the same colors. Um, so they did not distinguish, but they do give more WA calls in response to hearing or seeing a sharp and hawk. But things got really interesting when we look at the northern goshawk. So to seeing a northern goshawk, they give significantly more wall calls, but not when they hear one. Instead, when they hear a northern goshawk, they give significantly more WEC elements per WEC call. And then when we look at the number of wall elements per wall call, they make distinctions between seeing and hearing both the sharp and hawk and the northern goshawk. So they're giving significantly more WA elements per WA call in response to seeing a sharp and hawk or seeing a goshawk. When we look at the duty cycle of the WEC, they give significantly more, or so they have an increased WEC duty cycle, so more WECs than more sound than silence, to seeing a northern goshawk than to hearing a northern goshawk. And then finally, for the WA duty cycle, they actually decrease their duty cycle to seeing a sharp, to hearing a sharp and hawk in comparison to hearing the other stimuli. And then finally, for the red tail hawk mimics, I actually didn't point this out, but they did stay away for about two minutes to red tail hawks, meaning that they do deem them somewhat threatening. 
And, we, and again, um, I should have mentioned this earlier, we actually didn't have a robotic red-tailed hawk, so we only have the acoustic playback for the red-tailed hawk. And we found that when you play them a red-tailed hawk, they give you significantly more red-tailed hawk mimic calls back, which suggests a functionally referential piece to this alarm call story. Okay, so again, that was a lot of whining and whacking, so what does all of this actually mean? It means that cue modality definitely matters. Even if they don't distinguish in their behavior, in their foraging behavior, when we look at their alarm calls, they're definitely making distinctions between seeing a predator and hearing a predator. That hunting strategy definitely matters as well. Both chase predators, the sharp tooth hawk and the north of the hawk, are deemed the most threatening in comparison to the two pounce predators. And that size is important, but it's not everything again. And that there's an interaction between the cue modality, the hunting strategy, and the size that caused them to make really subtle and precise distinctions between predators. And that they're encoding this in relatively acoustically simple alarm calls. So the chickadees have chickas and dees that make up their alarm call, but the stellar jays just have repeated elements. It's the same thing over and over again. If they're able to change really subtle pieces in order to encode for really complex information about predators. Okay, so moving on in our uh, communication scheme to environmental space. So this is kind of a little side project, so I'm just gonna hit the highlights of it and move on. So again, how are mobbing calls acoustically structured to successfully transmit through different habitats? So in sound, <clears throat> as a call moves away from the center, it loses power. This is termed transmission loss and is measured in decibels. The farther it goes, the less power it has. There are two ways to measure transmission loss. You can subtract the receiver level from the source level to get that change, or you can calculate it using spreading loss, which is the inverse square law, plus attenuation, which is a really messy equation that takes frequency, um, temperature, humidity, and atmospheric pressure into account. And so, as I mentioned earlier, mobbing calls are kind of special in the fact that they actually need to transmit really far in order to reach other species and individuals to bring them to mob that predator. And so selection should act to make these uh, calls robust against degradation by the environment. And so what we did is we actually set out to try to test that. So again, um, I didn't do this work alone, so I have two undergrads who helped me, um, and actually we did all of this work in the middle of the night, um, because that's the only time it was quiet enough for us to play these calls and not have anthropogenic noise interfering. So Nora Carlson and Dusty Thomas were really important um, in helping me in the wee hours of the morning doing these experiments. So what we did is we took black cat chickadee calls and we played them back through an open, semi-open, <coughs> enclosed habitat and re-recorded it at different distances. So we re-recorded at one meter, 10 meters, 25 meters, 50 meters, and 100 meters. And so what we can do with this is actually create filter functions. So this is an example of a filter function. On the x-axis is frequency, and then I turn one of the Ds of the chicken D call on its side so that you can see the um, different power, uh, the intensity of power at different frequencies. And then on the y-axis is loss in power measured in relative decibels. Um, the green is the measured loss, so that subtracting that source from that receiver level. And then the calculated is the spreading loss plus attenuation. And so within a frequency bin, we can actually take the area under the curves and look at differences between the expected, the calculated, and the actual, the measured. And so what this allows us to do is that within a habitat type, but across distances, we can actually look at how the signal is degrading over distance. And then within a habitat, but across Sorry, within a distance but across habitats, we can actually start to quantify the transmission properties of different habitats. So this is, um, like I said, a side project and this work is still ongoing, but I think it's a really interesting way to start to look at how acoustic signals are actually linked to their habitat. Okay, so back to the communication scheme and the last piece, the receiver piece. How does the identity of the sender influence receiver response? So the crux of signal evolution really relies on this idea of reliable information. Information needs to be reliable in order for the receiver to use that information and respond in a way that is beneficial to the sender. And this is what keeps the communication system persisting throughout evolutionary time. And so we were interested in looking at how sender identity may influence reliability and therefore receiver response. So to do this work, I actually went all the way to Australia two summers ago it was winter over there. 
Um, and so I got an NSF EC grant uh, to work with Rob McGraw at Australian National University in Canberra. Um, if you don't know, Canberra is actually the capital of Australia and is located in the Australian Capital Territory, which is that tiny little black box up in the corner on the eastern side of the country. Um, Canberra gets kind of a bad rap, but it's an amazing place to work, and I did all of my work in these beautiful botanic gardens, the Australian National Botanic Gardens, which are right behind Australian National University. And so what we were interested in is starting to look at the communication network surrounding alarm calls. So it's really naive to think that communication exists in these little private conversations out in nature. And in fact, mobbing events are actually these big networks of multiple individuals and multiple species all interacting together to drive a predator from the area. And that these interactions are not random, they're actually organized communication networks involving multiple species and multiple individuals. And so that's what we wanted to do, is we wanted to try to map out a communication network of these five Australian species. So we have the red wallbird, which is about the size of a flicker. The New Holland honey eater, which is about the size between a robin and a chickadee. Um, the eastern spinebill, which is about the size of a chickadee. Superb fairy wren, which is smaller than a chickadee. And then white grouse scrub wren, which is about the size of a chickadee. So I talked a lot about predator size, hunting strategy, and all these different, this predator community, and how it affects senders and how it how this senders then encode information in their alarm calls. But the predator community is really different in Australia. In the Tanner Gardens, all of these species, regardless of their different sizes, pretty much share one predator, and that's the colored sparrow hawk. Um, and so it's a, a sipper, just like the sharp tin hawk and the northern goss hawk. Bird specialist, super scary. Okay, so with these five birds, we were interested in how sender identity influences receiver response. So again, I had help. Um, I have Thomas Rowell and Kate Johnson to thank. Um, these are two friends over in Australia who came out with me in the early mornings when it was actually really cold out, like actually wearing long underwear and hats and mittens cold out, um, to do this field work. And I also consoled me because every single piece of equipment broke at some point or another during my two months over there. Okay, so to get at how the identity of the sender influences receiver response, we had 11 stimuli. So we had a control, which we uh, used a crimson rosella bell call, which sounds like this. We then had four conspecific calls, and so we only have four species. The eastern spine bill is not included in this because it does not have a described mounting call. So what we wanted to do is we wanted, we wanted to make it sound like there are two individuals from the same species calling at the same time. So like this example from two New Hong Kong eaters. Maybe not. There we go. And then finally, we have the header specifics. We just paired all of the species together. So we wanted it to sound like two individuals from different species calling at the same time. So like this red wall bird and white grouse program. So to record responses, we did something a little different. We actually surveyed out three grids and set up microphone arrays. So microphone arrays are a set of time-synchronized recorders put out in space, and they allow you to record multiple species across time and as well as across space, which is pretty exciting. It's a relatively new technology, and this is actually one of the first applications of microphone arrays in an experimental setting. So um, this is what the equipment looked like. So we have uh, recorders and their synchronizers, which I'll talk about in a second. And so essentially what we did is we set up the recorders and synchronizers like this. Each grid got six recorders and a synchronizer set so that we can record within a, uh, the grid area. So as I mentioned, um, each recorder on the right has a little synchronizer and then on the left. These synchronizers were actually developed for this project by this guy, Pat Little, in Missoula. And they're a pretty ingenious little piece of technology. So what they do is they essentially emit a time-synced um, signal into the recorder. And what it allows me to do is actually line up all the recordings so they all start and end at exactly the same time. So we end up with these multi-channel recordings where we can actually locate a call across multiple channels. And this actually allows us tr to triangulate in on a species. So not only do we get what the species is and when it is calling, but also where it is calling from. So the acoustic analysis is still being worked out here. Um, but I did take some behavioral data, and that's what I'm going to present to you. So we ended up with three grids, 11 stimuli, two replicates for a total of 66 playback experiments. Um, I did a two-minute pre-playback, followed by a three-minute playback, and then a five-minute post-playback. 
So as I mentioned, the acoustic uh, analysis is still ongoing because these files are huge and these birds are really noisy. So um, the behavioral data I took essentially is if they started to mob. So if they approached the speaker and if they gave mobbing calls either during the playback or during the post playback. So I'm gonna just present some preliminary data. So in response to the control, except for the New Holland honey ear and the Eastern Spinebill, none of the other species responded in a mobbing way to the control which tells me that the control, at least for the other two species, is actually the control. So in contrast, when you play any sort of mobbing call, every single species is more likely to in, um, engage in some sort of mobbing behavior than in comparison to the control. So getting down to more specifics, red wallabirds are more likely to mob if the red wallabird is in the playback. So either it's paired with another species or two red wallabirds calling at the same time. And at first I thought this was maybe because of that size difference, but then they share the same predators, so that didn't really make sense to me. So what I think is going on is that red wallabirds are um, nectar feeders, and they viciously, viciously defend banksia bushes against anything and everything. So they often elicit alarm calls from these other species defending their bushes. So it may be that they don't pay attention to the other species simply because it's not a reliable signal. Okay, so per very friends, that little guy on the right, they are more likely to respond if it's two different species calling at the same time. And this again could be because of reliability. If one species is calling, it could be to something that doesn't concern another species. But if two species are calling, it may be more reliable that a predator is actually in the area. So as I mentioned, the acoustic um, analysis is still ongoing, and I think that's gonna help me suss out a lot of these arrows and get direction of weight to these arrows to try to actually quantify a communication network of danger. Okay, so this brings us full circle back to Claude Shannon and information theory and this complex figure. So again, in order to understand both the ecology and evolution of any sort of signaling system, we need to look at all of these pieces, both individually and the interactions between them, in order to understand. And so that might, that's what my dissertation has been focused on. And with that, I will happily take any questions. single individual may be less likely to mob than if there's company, you know, mm -hmm. that could join him in the, in the process of mob, mobbing that. And did, did you look at anything about proclivity uh, to, to mob if there are more chickadees in mm -hmm. the president of the feeder, then they more likely to mob as opposed to a single chickadee mm -hmm. in the feeder is, you know, less uh, attractive to mobbing. Yeah. Yeah, so for the chickadees, they form mixed species flocks in the winter, so they are rarely alone. Um, the stellar shay, I did have a couple feeders that only had one stellar shay, and so I didn't use those feeders for that exact reason, is that, and this is completely anecdotal, but when we were working with Kate Davis's birds, we were just toying around and stuff, and if there's only one stellar shay, they gave no calls whatsoever, which is really surprising for stellar shay, because they kind of don't shut up, ever. <laughs> That, that, because that makes me wonder, sometimes if you do like a, 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 a pygmy owl or something, mm -hmm. you're just doing it both you know, whistling, yep. and sometimes you can bring a lot of chickadees in, sometimes it doesn't work at all. I mean, you go to the chicken in the area, one or two, but they don't seem to respond at all. I just wonder why sometimes they seem to be more likely to be buzzing around your head, but other times it's just like they ignore you. Yeah, um, I think there's a couple things going on. I think numbers definitely do matter. Um, and then, so there's this idea of audience effect. And so for mobbing events, the more individuals we have, it makes sense that the better mobbing you're gonna do, and quicker, more quickly can you remove the predator from the area. Um, but then there's also a, um, the, a seasonal effect as well. And so they actually tend to mob adult 
predators less. So predators that actually feed on adults, not nestlings, in the breeding season. So if you're giving a pygmy alcohol in the breeding season, they're probably really preoccupied with nest predators and they don't actually usually respond. Yes? So I was wondering if they have like regional dialects. And um, because, you know, I listen to these things on my bird app mm -hmm. and also, you know, the birds from out in the field and I'm totally not an expert, but if they have regional dialects, mm -hmm. then does the alarm communication work as well? if you have birds from different dialects yep. with their... Yeah, so for for my southern shades, they're the same subspecies in eastern Cascades and over here. They're, I don't know so much about regional dialects. There are regional mimicries. Um, they tend to mimic different things in different areas, so they mimic red-shouldered hawk, not red-tailed hawk, on the west coast in California. They mimic northern goshawks more in the south than they do up here. And it may just be because of predator densities, I'm not really 100% sure. But there is a lot of individual variation as well. So for crows at least, they you can tell um, individual identity by their call. And it's thought that most corvids do have that ability. And so there is individual variation. As far as its effect on your ability to listen to each other, the calls are, they still sound like wah calls, even if it's slightly different. And so they still respond. Um, I did a bunch of playbacks of wah and weck calls to see, to make sure that they actually respond to their own bobbing call. And they definitely, definitely do. Um, and it didn't really matter if it was from, um, I got them off the lab of O, the Macaulay Library. So they're not even from Montana, they're not even local. And so my, one of my concerns was that if I'm playing calls not from that flock, that they may respond in a territorial way, but I didn't find that at all. They don't seem to care. What sense does the predator mimics make? Why do they do that? It's just why do predators make sound? Yeah, why, why do they mimic the predators? Excellent question. I originally that was one of my dissertation questions, but it's really hard to answer. Um, so what I think is going on is they're using it in an alarm context. I think they do red tail hawk here because that's just what they have the most experience with hearing. Um, so I think learning has not so much to do with, they're able to learn a lot of different calls, but they're just unexposed to be able to learn it. But I think um, when I play red tail hawk to them, they give me red tail hawk and it's back. So it's, it's called functionally referential. Um, so essentially this idea that there's a certain call linked to a certain predator type. And so it seems that maybe that might be what's going on here. Um, other reasons that birds mimic is also to increase their repertoire size in a sexual selection context. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case because both males and females give uh, mimetic calls and they do it outside the breeding season. So it's maybe just uh, calling the attention of others or maybe the same species. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So what I wanted to do, yeah, what I wanted to do was play the mimetic calls back to the predators okay. to see if they could tell. But it turns out the best way to do this is to find the nests of the predators. And it turns out if you play anything near their nest, they get really mad. So it's really hard to tease apart if it's actually in response to a medic call or if it's just the fact that something is near their nest and they're all upset about it. So I haven't quite figured out how to tease that apart yet. Has kind of jumped onto that. Have you tried to play the mimic calls to the other pastorians? So when I play red tail hawk mimetic calls to a feeder, no other species cares. So the species, the, the other species can tell that that's not they don't care to red tail. So the other species there are chickpeas. Chickpeas don't care about red tail hawks, okay. really. So I don't think that it has so much that they can tell that it's a mimetic call. It's just that it's a red tail hawk call, and they don't pay attention. So yeah, I'm not really sure. Yeah. Where was it that, that they were mimicking god hawks? What part of the country? Um, down south in the southwest. Um, there's actually a really cool little paper. They were doing goshawk surveys, right? So they just play goshawk, the goshawk responds, then they check it, there's a goshawk in the area. And then they had so many goshawks, it was amazing. And then they figured out that like 15% were actually stellar jays. Right. Calls. I've heard them do that yeah. here, but mostly the problem is with the gray jays. They're not real good, but mm -hmm. they're enough to take you out for a while. So yeah. you realize it's 
not quite powerful. It's not quite right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not quite powerful enough, but it's it's pretty good. And, and I remember one, one time my friend said, are you sure that's in the gospel? I said, no, I can see the mouth yeah. you know, moving on that Stella J when he's playing. Yep. That is a good gossip call. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think they're better at the gossip than they are at the red tail hawk, personally. Yeah. Did you look at any of the predator behavior? Like if the red tail hawk was calling, it wasn't attacking the sheriff should not a hawk was calling, it wasn't attacking the Excellent question. So mm -hmm. all of these predators only call when they're perched. So all of the calls we use are their own territory calls. So that's a really important just, um, piece of this is that if a predator is actually hunting, they're not calling. So it could, and also some of these predators don't call in the winter. So shark and hawks and northern goshawks only call really in the spring and the summer. But they still respond to this. So it means that it's enough of a cue to still warrant a response and to be on the lookout. That's why they're trying to freak out when they stop hearing a call. I think that's exactly what happened, yeah. So if you think about it, if a, if a shark and hawk is calling, you get rough direction and distance as well as ID. But as soon as it stops calling, all that information is gone. You have no, I, I equate it to seeing a shark when you're snorkeling. Like you're snorkeling around, you see a shark, you're like, oh my gosh, it's a shark. Everything's gonna be fine. And then you continue on, and then you don't see the shark anymore, and that's when you start to panic, because you have no idea if it's coming behind you. So that's what, that's why I think it's going on with chickens. So, with all of the, the stuff that you did down in Australia with the interaction between like the four and five species of birds, mm -hmm. do you think you'd see that during the summer up here when there's warblers and nuthatches and finches and all the seasonal birds back here? That's an excellent question. So there's um, a really cool paper that just uh, came out recently that looks at the seasonal effect um, looking at migratory birds versus non-migratory birds. What I have found personally, I actually try to do my field work in the summer because it's way more fun to sit outside in the summer than it is in the winter. And none of the birds cared when I played any of these predator calls. So I think it is really important to do this stuff in the breeding season. I think they're preoccupied with breeding and they're more focused on nest predators than they are about their own predators in the breeding season. So, and then it was winter in Australia. So I think if I went in the summer in Australia and tried to do this, that I wouldn't get the same um, response. And the other thing about this stuff too, stellar jays are predators in the summertime. Yet they exist um, cooperatively with chickadees and nuthatches and woodpeckers all of the feeder during the winter time, but in the summer, stellar jays are predators to them, to their nestlings. Yes. Did you ever? I mean, you've got so much field game, right? <laughs> Fun, different places, dark, you know, light. What what other findings do you have that you haven't reported? I mean, we have like. Well, this is really interesting. I haven't thought about this yet. Or, you know, we saw this one bird hanging out with this other bird. Yeah. And we didn't realize they did this. And we'd be fine. And you, what are some of the other cool things? That you yeah. Do? So my big concern when I started grad school was that I was going to run out of questions. But that has definitely not been the problem, obviously. Um, so one of the biggest questions that came up with the stellar shades, that is when I talked about this crux of signal evolution, this idea of reliable information, alarm calls are kind of interesting, the fact that they're proven not to be that reliable. So there's a couple studies about them being used deceptively. They're given a lot of times when there's not a predator around, and yet species still pay attention to them. So how come they can be unreliable and still be used? And it may be that the cost of not responding is so great that it's worth paying attention to a couple wrong ones in order to make sure that you're paying attention to a right one as well. So what I wanted to do was actually test how reliable does an alarm call need to be in order to be useful. So my plan was, I would pair one of these robotic raptors with novel sounds a certain percentage of the time and present them to stellar jays. So I, know I would put out a northern goshawk and then play a sound 100% um, of the time. So every single time they heard that sound, they saw a northern goshawk. I would have another sound where every single, or 50% of the time that they heard that sound, they saw a northern goshawk. So I tried that this last season, and they did not care at all. They did not pay attention at all to me. And then I was like, okay, maybe stellar jays are too smart, right? Corvids are really smart. So then I tried to nut hatches, and they also didn't care. <laughs> so one of my big questions is still trying to figure out a good way to test how reliable does an alarm call need to be in order to be useful? And I do not have the answer to that. But that's, I would really like to answer that question. Do they ever hit your models there? Oh. Excellent question, yes. <laughs> the goshawk head actually is crazy glued on because they mopped it to the point where it fell off. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. 
the two peas don't really pop the Northern Cross pop, they don't really care. Yeah. And maybe you've seen that picture of a, of a, of a uh, great horned owl in the snow in uh, Chuck Trow's shoes. So he put it there and had the uh, magpie uh, footprints around it were like right next to the tail where they're pulling the tail, but way oh, wide. Really? <laughs> Way wide out in front with yeah. business end. Yeah. Yeah, this is kind of interesting. But interesting, yeah. Yeah, they take a beating uh, like uh, great horned owls that uh, yeah. used to catch goshawks, mm -hmm. but they, they get smacked. Yeah, it's actually thought that that's why northern pygmy owls have two little black dots on the back yeah. of their heads. It's big eye spots. They never hit those. Mm -hmm. So they get mobbed. Pardon? Did they ever hit that one? Yes, the chickadees come at it. Chickadees hit They're not strong enough to knock the head off, thank goodness. <laughs> Well, please feel free to come on up and keep the conversation going. Uh, we'll see you guys in the chatting. Thank you very much. Sustain.